Happy Friday, everyone. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Ijeon in Seoul. Let's get started with a look at today's highlights. The Finance Ministry lays out revised guidelines for next year's budget designed to reflect President Moon Jae-in's pledges, including job creation and increased income. Following the recent WannaCry ransomware attack, we take a closer look at bitcoins and how they're used in the process. These stories are more coming right up. Government ministries have started to revise their spending plans for next year to incorporate the pledges of the new Moon Jae-in administration. The finance ministry notified them of its spending guidelines for 2018, which puts an extra emphasis on funding that will help to create jobs. Our Kim ji has the details. The Ministry of Strategy and Finance has released guidelines for government ministries to reflect President Moon Jae-in's policies and their budget spending plans for next year. The guidelines include his pledges related to job creation, achieving income-driven growth and resolving issues concerning low birth rates and fine dust pollution. The Finance Ministry says the priority should be to fund government-led projects highly likely to create new jobs, which was President Moon's number one campaign pledge. Regarding income-driven growth, the Ministry says it will work towards reducing inequality among jobs by converting irregular workers in the public sector to permanent salaried workers while shortening overtime office hours. The Finance Ministry says the 2018 budget amounts to 371.5 billion U.S. dollars, up about 17 billion dollars from this year's. The ministry also says it advised to increase financial support for low-income earners to meet their lifelong needs and improve the quality of their lives, as well as expand the number of public child daycare centers nationwide. Some parts of the original plan that ministries are instructed to keep include preparations for the so-called Fourth Industrial Revolution and resolving issues related to wealth polarization. Government ministries have to submit the revised version of their 2018 budget plans to the finance ministry by the end of the month. Kim ji Business Daily. President Moon Jae-in's nominee for the country's antitrust watchdog, Kim Sang-jo, has an economics background and unique experience in Korea's financial markets. He's also on the same page with the president when it comes to enforcing fairness and the rule of law in the corporate sector. Our Lee Joo-young has more. Economics professor and longtime shareholder activist Kim Sang-jo, nominated to lead Korea's Fair Trade Commission, says he will put the country's top four conglomerates under the microscope as part of efforts to establish fair business practices. But Kim explained, his focus on reforms for family-run conglomerates, or tebor, does not mean he's looking to break up the major business groups. Instead, as chief, he says he will apply stricter standards when assessing issues related to potential violations of the law and good corporate governance. If I become the new chief of the commission, I'll work to restore the rule of law in the local business market so that all of the entities have a fair chance to demonstrate their abilities, which is essential to revitalizing the Korean economy. Kim also argues that the division currently overseeing business groups should be upgraded to a bureau to keep big businesses from riding roughshod over small companies and to level a playing field that's been dominated by conglomerates for decades. Four conglomerates in particular, Samsung, Hyundai Motor, SK and LG Group, account for two-thirds of the assets held by the country's top 30 business groups, an immense concentration of wealth, widely viewed as intensifying economic polarization and preventing wealth from trickling down to the masses. Kim says he will also work to untangle tie-ups between the financial sector and industry and work with other ministries so that the changes don't result in a shock to the local economy. Lee joo Business Daily. President Moon is also expected to make changes to the current merit-based pay system for public institutions instead of scrapping it altogether. The president during his campaign had pledged to do away with the performance-based wage system if elected, but it looks more likely that there will be readjustments that would require companies to reflect the opinions of their workers. 
120 public institutions have implemented the system as of early June last year, which sparked a strong backlash from the labor unions, citing a unilateral decision from management. Instead of scrapping the system, the Moon government looks likely to encourage management and labor to find common ground. Meanwhile, a court ruling on Thursday supported claims by the labor union of a state housing guarantee corporation, saying that forced implementation of the system violates labor laws. The Korean equity market rebounded on the last day of the week. Foreign investors bought shares on the Kospi for four consecutive sessions. And to give us a wrap-up of this week's stock market action, we're now joined by our market's contributor, Choi jin -sak. Hello, jin -sak. Thanks for having me. All right, so how are things looking on the last day of trading? Both the Kospi and the Kostong market slightly rebounded from yesterday's drop. The Kospi inched up to close at 2288.48, while the Kostok followed with a 0.68% uptick to close at 642. The Kospi fluctuated throughout the session and the market stayed mostly in negative territory early, uh, in early hours due to political uncertainty from the U.S. However, it soon erased early losses and stayed in positive territory in the afternoon as foreign investors lifted the market despite selling by both retail investors and institutions. The Kospi couldn't rise further because Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, which are the largest and the second largest stock by market cap, experienced a sharp decline. Most blue chip stocks except those two enjoyed a rally though. Individual stocks on the Kospi market tend to move on issues related to holding company structures. Although Hyundai Motor today denied a media report that it is seeking to introduce a holding company structure, the company's share prices rose sharply due, uh, during today's session. Then how is the overall weekly performance? I mean, it seems that investors have witnessed a limited volatility throughout the week. Right. On a weekly basis, the cost, uh, cost P was mostly flat, while the cost that was down slightly. Although foreign investors bought shares on a weekly basis, the cost P market failed to go higher as institutions unloaded almost the same amount. Retail investors were net buyers on the market as well. Due to a political uncertainty from overseas markets, volatility of both indexes have been relatively limited throughout the week. The so-called risk appetite was somewhat sluggish too. By sector, auto, uh, consumer staples, and uh, communications performed strongly while biotechnology, utilities, and chemicals were sluggish. Now, political drama out of Washington has continued to affect investor sentiment throughout global markets. Mm -hmm. So what factors are investors here in Korea keeping a close eye on? Although global investors are focusing on political uncertainty from the U.S. and the potential impeachment of President Donald Trump, experts also say Brazil's case can also affect sentiment going forward. President uh, Michel Temer is under investigation is in connection with a corruption scandal and opponents are calling for his impeachment. The country's financial market plunged after the news came out. If President uh, Temer leaves office early, expectations for structural reforms in Brazil might see a substantial drop and the issue might negatively affect overall liquidity flowing into broader emerging markets. However, not all things look too gloomy. Experts also say political uncertainty spurred in the U.S. can positively affect Korea's financial market because the issue can keep the value of the U.S. dollar lower and global oil prices higher. Market Watch also said even an impeachment of President Trump wouldn't necessarily derail the administration's push for tax cuts. Now, moving on to broader Asian equity markets, the mm -hmm. Chinese market has been on a roller coaster ride this week. Exactly. The Shanghai market has fluctuated throughout the week. The composite index rose on Monday and Tuesday, and it fell on Wednesday and Thursday. And even uh, during today's session, the market failed to find its clear direction. There has been a mixed picture throughout the market due to uh, positive catalysts such as expectations for a liquidity injection and negative factors including political uncertainty. Experts say since the Chinese market is in a period of correction in the midterm, investors tend to unload shares uh, as soon as the index rises for a while. In other words, investors in the Chinese market are still in the so-called profit-taking mode. 
Now, the Japanese equity market has been on a similar path this week, and it looks like movements in the value of the Japanese yen mm -hmm. affected the investor sentiment. That's right. Uh, the Japanese market has been on a roller coaster ride throughout the week as well. The Nikkei index rose to the highest level since December of 20, uh, uh, 2015. On Tuesday, rising oil prices helped lift the entire sentiment. However, the market had fallen for two consecutive sessions until yesterday, and the index didn't move much during today's session. The reason is the yen has strengthened as political uncertainty from overseas markets has reignited uh, investor appetite for safe haven assets. I said earlier that the uh, falling dollar value can help the Korean market going forward. Therefore, two markets are expected to move in somewhat different directions. All right, thank you so much for that today. No problem. While campaigning, several Korean presidential candidates, including President Moon Jae-in, promised reforms to reduce government regulations for businesses. Now, a recent study shows that Korea needs such changes now more than ever as the country continues to sink in global competitiveness rankings for government regulatory burden. Our Kwon jong woo has this report. The World Economic Forum ranked Korea's government regulatory burden in the lowest third globally, and a recent report shows that it's gotten worse. In 2009, Korea was ranked 98th out of 144 countries, but a study in 2017 by the Korea Economic Research Institute ranks the country 105th. Conversely, the UK, which ranked 86th in 2009, shot up to 25th during the same period of time. The study concluded that the UK was able to reduce regulations due to a policy called one in, two out, and later one in, three out. That means every time a new regulation is adopted, two or three regulations must be eliminated. Through this process, UK businesses are said to have benefited from 10 billion US dollars worth of annual savings. US President Donald Trump also pledged during his campaign to implement a one in, two out policy. High government regulations mean a reduction in flexibility and creativity for businesses, making them less able to adapt and change and reduce competitiveness against international businesses. Past administrations in Korea have promised to bring about change, but there's been little substantial progress. Because Korea has such a high number of regulations, there are many people and departments involved, so every time change is attempted, it brings up a lot of controversies and conflicts, which in turn is time-consuming. Experts say that to bring about effective change and move Korea up the regulatory burden ranking, the government will need to take control and systemize the changes. Policies such as the one-in, two-out or the one-in, three-out need to be made into law so that they are not affected by changes in government, economic situations or any other external factors. Business Daily. Low-income earners may soon receive some extra assistance as Korea's new president looks to implement policy aimed at reducing financial burdens. Here's our Ellie Kim with what new policies we can expect to see. With President Moon Jae-in now in office, it's expected that he will further implement policies to reduce interest payments and credit card fees for low-income earners and small businesses. Rising debt burdens are increasingly pushing people over the brink, with debtors in some cases taking their own lives and even their families. In light of this, the new government is likely to focus on how to reduce the financial burden of those who are most vulnerable. When it comes to loans, the interest rate ceiling for second-tier lenders has fallen over the years, seeing a dramatic drop from 66% in 2002 to current levels just under 28%. The government plans to further reduce that to 20% during President Moon's term. In addition to that, credit card processing fees will be lowered for medium-sized businesses from 1.3 to 1 percent and small businesses down to 0.8 percent. The new government will also look to protect consumers by preventing financial institutions from extending payment on bad debts past their deadlines or reselling them to other lenders. It will also look to establish procedures to protect consumers from excessive or unfair lending. <laughs> The government hopes that reducing the burden on borrowers and protecting consumers will ease the struggles of low-income earners. 
Elliot Kim, Business Daily. A new ferry service between North Korea and Russia has started operations with the North Korean passenger ship docking in Vladivostok for the first time on Thursday. The vessel will sail once a week to the far eastern Russian port city and will carry passengers and cargo. Watchers believe this is the latest effort by Pyongyang to forge closer ties and boost economic cooperation with Moscow. The new ferry link is the only regular service of its kind, connecting North Korea to the rest of the world, and the ferry operator expects to attract many tourists, particularly from China. Time now for a look through some important global business stories from the week with our Eunice Kim, who joins us in the studio today. Hello, Eunice. Hello. All right, so the fear that stemmed from the global ransomware attack seems to be subsiding a bit, but the strike is reviving talk of bitcoins. That's right, and of course, bitcoin is the cryptocurrency that the attackers had demanded in exchange for the release of files that they were holding hostage. But what is bitcoin exactly? How do you buy it? And is is it still just an online gamer's currency? Take a look. I was a little surprised it wasn't as sophisticated. The hackers behind the ransomware strike WannaCry threatened to wipe out the files of hundreds of thousands of machines it took over in 150 countries. The ransom, 300 US dollars in Bitcoin, would unlock the hack. Otherwise, the files, after a doubling of the fee, would be deleted forever. Uh, despite appearing to be criminal activity intended to raise money, it appears that less than $70,000 has been paid in ransoms, and we are not aware if payments have led to any data recovery. As its transmission ebbed, the strike has pushed Bitcoin firmly back into the global dialogue. The value of the cryptocurrency surged to new highs as news of the ransomware spread crossing past the $1,800 mark in just two days after surpassing $1,700 for the first time last week. The price of Bitcoin is literally dictated by supply and demand without the interference of governments, regulators and central banks. Supply is capped at 21 million Bitcoins in the world and demand is whatever the buyer is willing to pay. While most banks and institutions have shunned the e-money as volatile and speculative and the currency of online criminals, its returns, especially after this week, is making it tempting. The value of one Bitcoin has more than quadrupled since this time last year, making it worth more than an ounce of gold with much more handsome returns. A $1,000 investment in 2011 would be worth millions now. Even if you had put down $100 when it began in 2009, it would be worth close to $3 million today. Bitcoins can be bought through many online platforms, but would-be investors should consider the risks. In 2013, the virtual currency lost half of its value within six hours when BTC China, then the world's largest Bitcoin exchange by volume, halted its yuan deposits. The following year, Japan's Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox, infamously announced its trade suspension after $460 million in investors' Bitcoin holdings went missing. But that hasn't stopped many people from putting their hard-earned cash toward the digital money, shooting up their values. And regulators, one by one, are beginning to take another look at digital currency too. The Bank of Korea is among a pool of central banks closely studying their adoption. So more and more countries are thinking about jumping into this uh, cryptocurrency bandwagon, but then it's Japan that seems to be leading the pack uh, by preparing to, I guess, regulate trade uh, bitcoins, right? That's absolutely right. And Japan, in fact, is already one of the world's largest trading centers of bitcoin by volume and the record price of bitcoin reached this week has been credited to the japanese government recently legalizing bitcoin on the first of last month it passed a law that recognized bitcoin 
as a legal form of payment. And from there, the Japan Financial Services Agency has been tasked with regulating cryptocurrency trade. That's including setting capital requirements, annual audits, as well as cybersecurity rules. Now, anyone who wants to trade Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency in Japan will have to register with the FSA. And the Financial Times reports many exchanges and businesses have already responded with enthusiastic inquiries and formal registrations. It also reports that if even a fraction of Japan's FX margin traders shift their money toward the Bitcoin market, it could be, quote, transformational as their quarterly volumes already add up to about 10 trillion U.S. dollars. Now, citing a hedge fund manager, CNBC also adding, we could soon see major Japanese banks trading Bitcoin as any other currency. Well, so the momentum seems to be picking up on the regulatory end as well. But now, before we let you go, let's over, head over to Europe. What's new there? Right. So after a moderate candidate, Emmanuel Macron, was elected and sworn in as France's youngest president on Sunday, his first overseas visit was to go see EU de facto leader German Chancellor Angela Merkel. The two leaders shook hands and agreed that a roadmap should be explored and created with the goal of deepening the European Union integration and make the euro more resilient against crises in light of the UK getting ready to leave the bloc. Here's German Chancellor Angela Merkel. For the medium-term outlook of the European Union, we agreed that we want to develop a roadmap. These sort of projects can't be built overnight. But there's a common conviction that we cannot just deal with Britain leaving the EU, but also have to think about strengthening the existing European Union and especially the Eurozone. And Merkel added Germany would be open to revising EU treaties if necessary. Their governments will further discuss the matter in July. This as the German leader snagged a political victory of her own this week. Her Christian Democratic Union party bagged its third and final state election, which is also the country's most populous state. It's an encouraging sign for the general election that's coming up in September. And we'll keep our eyes on those developments. Thank you so much for coming in today. You bet. And that wraps it up for today and this week. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back next week with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.